This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Thanks, Squarespace. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the Jersey Shore for a long overdue vacation. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I want to talk about a genre of photographic gear I usually don't discuss. Vacation cameras. Maybe it's because Claudia and I haven't taken a real vacation in six years. Maybe it's because over many decades I've simply always taken the one camera system that makes me happiest, which usually also meant the only camera system I owned at the time. Or it could be that for the last half decade, like so many of us, I've always had an iPhone on me with at least one 12 megapixel camera built in, never mind the computational imaging that has evolved since 2017 and the four cameras on my current iPhone 13 Pro Max. Hold that thought. A couple of weeks ago, as our children began to drive and fly in from across the country for the first Jersey Shore vacation we'd taken together in just about a decade and a half, which we used to do every summer beginning in the early 90s, hold that thought, Claudia and I had to decide which camera each of us would bring. I no longer owned the Sony RX100 Mark IV, yeah, four, I'd bought years earlier as a travel camera because I found it to be, of course, your mileage may vary and that's fine. Really, neither fish nor fowl. On the one hand, it had offered speed, resolution, a useful focal range, a truly pocketable set of dimensions and weight, and an actual EVF. On the other hand, it had proven fiddly. Perhaps it was too small for my hands. And the one-inch sensor suffered from limited dynamic range, even more limited low-light performance, both of which mattered to me, given my ambitions for it. I thus first considered my 60-megapixel Leica M11, recently returned to me, replaced, actually, under warranty, with its relatively small footprint, incredible dynamic range, tiny jewel-like manual focus lenses, and the joy I feel every time I pick it up. The idea of slowing down at the beach and the appeal of doing the same thing with my camera were really compelling to me. But with no weather ceiling and a downright nasty environment for cameras, call it the quintfecta of sand, salt water, sea air, high ambient temperatures, and the sun's brutal UV rays, especially if I planned to swap lenses every now and again, combined with no autofocus option at all, even when it might come in very handy. No IBIS at all, when it might come in very handy, I reluctantly put it back in its safe place. Next, I turn to this guy, my 47.5 megapixel Leica SL2, where the pros and cons were equally clear. Once again, I considered the SL2's own spectacular image quality. Now, with precisely all of the mod cons, the M11 lacks, which might allow me, in the end, even higher image quality, more impetus to actually take the camera out. Conveniences like IBIS, autofocus, outstanding weather ceiling, I mean, truly the best I have ever seen, and an integrated high-resolution EVF, meaning no need to futz with an external one like the VisoFlex 2 I have for the M11, and in turn, no need to worry about electrical contacts in that environment if, say, I wanted to shoot wider than 35 millimeter, really, or longer than 75. Then again, my SL2 kit with primes like the Summicron SL Apo 35 and Sigma 85mm 1.4 DGDN Art would be significantly bigger and heavier than my M11. And even with weather sealing, I didn't particularly wish to expose the SL2's sensor or shutter to the elements when changing lenses. So I put that kit away too. I never really considered uh, this guy or Sony a7 IV because I use it for work rather than pleasure, almost exclusively video at that. I don't enjoy it in hand the same way I do my Leicas. And yeah, I didn't want to run the risk of getting that camera in trouble too. The easiest thing to do was decide I wouldn't take any serious shots and could therefore live quite easily with just my 
iPhone 13 Pro, which <laughs> the rubber's coming apart and the icon is fading. I bet you didn't expect that because I didn't either. But the reality is from stills to video, portrait mode to cinematic mode, I've found my last couple of iPhones to be much more useful and less fiddly casual image making companions than the RX100 Mark IV I mentioned a few minutes ago, far more impervious to the elements. Best of all, it would be on me all the time anyway, in a pocket, meaning that in a very real sense, that camera would weigh nothing. It also meant that with the three rear lenses computationally linked, from long exposure to color and metering more generally, there'd be even less futzing with a ridiculously high probability that, again, for casual viewing, its images would be more than fine, actually beating any dedicated camera I've ever had for giving me the shortest distance between intent and execution, say for Instagram or just sharing with family. What about weaknesses? For its intended purpose, given my lowered ambitions, the iPhone 13 Pro Max had just about none. Although, to be fair, and upon close inspection, the 13 Pro Max didn't always nail the simulated bokeh, and I had no desire to spend time in post cloning away errant hair or fakakta backgrounds. Yes, I have pre-ordered the 14 Pro. Meanwhile, Claudia had no difficulty making her decisions. Her only question was, would she take a camera at all? Put differently, would she feel comfortable without her camera? Claudia's internal dialogue, <laughs> it lasted for less than 10 seconds. She had no intention of throttling her photographic ambitions. She then grabbed her usual camera, which I happen to have here, the uh, Nikon Z7 II with the 24-72.8 to X, spectacular, and a small shoulder bag, and she was ready to go. Why was it so much easier for her? At one level, it was as simple as this. She doesn't like change. She isn't a gearhead. And she loves her Z7 II. The iPhone, hers is an 11 something, just doesn't cut it for her optically. The ultra wide angle on that puppy is just poor and there's no joy in it. Her Z7 II offers basically the same pros as my SL2. Also spectacular image quality. Also all the mod cons, wonderful glass, but with two additional pros. First, she would only be bringing the one zoom meaning she'd never need to swap it out for something else, allowing her to worry a whole lot less about the sensor or shutter being impacted by the environment. Second, it's a whole lot lighter and smaller than my SL2 with a bunch of primes. Well, okay, third, although not directly relevant, it's a heck of a lot less expensive. The only con, and Claudia was fine with it, was that she knew she'd have to go out with it separately, with intent, rather than schlepping it with her everywhere, just in case. She had no concerns about her Nikon kit handling the elements in that scenario, and in the end brought home shots like this. And this. But a funny thing happened as Claudia explained her thought process to me. She got me thinking more deeply. Well, it's not that funny, actually. It's pretty common, but hey, I enjoy the wordplay. It amuses me, so there you go. Anyway, I wondered, what if my ambition were to rise above snapshots? What would I do then? Suddenly, clarity. I strode past both of my Pinnacle stills cameras and my very competent across-the-board hybrid A7 IV and grabbed my now-discontinued 24-megapixel APS-C like a CL with the gorgeous little Sumicron TL 23F2, the full frame equivalent field of view and depth of field of call it a 35 2.8. No ibis, no weather sealing, no high resolution either. And it didn't matter. It takes up almost no space and it's light as a feather, relatively speaking. I love its form factor and its image quality for what it is, it inspires me. And I, too, would only take it out when I was ready to shoot with intent. In the meantime, I had my 13 Pro Max. Most of the time, I took snapshots or a little video of our family, all under one roof, under a beach umbrella or underwater, reveling in each other and the rhythms of the ocean. These are too personal for me to share with you. But in the final hours of our stay, I did become ambitious and got sterling images from both of my cameras like this.
even as 17 by 22 inch prints. Can you tell which camera was used for which image? Would it surprise you to learn that I actually mistook one taken with the iPhone for one taken with the CL? Of course, I've cherry-picked the best images from each camera. I've edited significantly in post. I took shots suited to the limitations of each camera and reaffirmed what I already knew, which is that at the margin, be it glitches in computationally produced bokeh, too much default sharpening, or finding the breaking point in pushing 12 megapixel HEIC files, my smartphone couldn't do what my CL can. But how many of us actually push that hard, especially on vacation? I guess 99% of the time, less than 1% of us. On the other hand, what can't the CL do that my smartphone can? From three-second handheld shots to zero inertial drag HDR and slow-mo 4K video, it turns out quite a bit. But forget about all of this tech talk. What did you see in those images? What did you feel? I was stunned looking at them later to realize that I see, I feel, the end of summer, okay, but more than that, I feel Tremendous loss. There are a few morals to this story. First, best means different things to different people or even to a single person under different circumstances. It's a waste of time, money, energy, and goodwill. In other words, it's simply silly to argue about someone else's choices or go down the rabbit hole yourself. It's much more useful to learn from these other choices and to recognize how imposing limitations on one's own self can enhance one's creativity and happiness. Second, you do not need to spend big to photograph happy. I love what I got with my CL, which, okay, fine, is expensive, no two ways about it. Although this is relative, it is a fraction of the cost of my other Leicas. The iPhone 13 Pro Max, incredibly credible, except when it wasn't. Net net, I was really happy with the results, given my ambition for them. Stunned, actually, when I mistook this particular image, the one to which I alluded moments ago, as uh, one I took with the CL, but which I actually took with a 13 Pro Max. But as I also implied, the CL, with its much larger sensor and brilliant prime lens, gave me headroom the iPhone couldn't, even with the 13 Pro Max's 5 nanometer, very impressive, A15 bionic computational power. We We'll see how the 14 Pro does with those 48 megapixels in ProRes RAW. But 14 Pro or whatever follows, I would not bet against the power of Moore's Law. Now, you might argue that whatever the particular iPhone model, last year's, this year's, next year's, an iPhone is a $1,000 plus camera, which isn't cheap either. I understand, but I disagree. I think of the camera as essentially free, a fringe benefit of the phone, which stands quite on its own as a phone and handheld computer for a variety of reasons. No need to go through them here. The more important point is that you don't need either one to get great images on vacation. Of course, while ours was a beach vacation, vacations take many forms and sometimes a different kind of camera entirely is the way to go. Say a compact super zoom like the Sony RX10 Mark IV, with integrated 24 to 600 full frame equivalent field of view for wildlife adventures, a Lumix GX85 with 15 millimeter f1.7, the full frame field of view equivalent of a 30 millimeter for street snaps or casual travel shots, maybe an old school 35 millimeter Canon F1 with FD 51.8 for just about anything really, as long as you don't mind the wait to see what you get. At which point though, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of just 200 bucks, though that number, of course, does not include film processing and scanning. I'll put links to our budget gourmet series of videos in the show notes below. Third, with all of this said, I'd still love to see a, call it a CL2, with a state-of-the-art, high-resolution, stacked BSI sensor, IBIS, state-of-the-art, hybrid face detect autofocus, debugged 5.7 million dot EVF, an updated version of the TL's ambitious, ahead-of-its-time smartphone-like touch interface, and the computational power of iPhone 14's A16 Bionic to drive everything this combination could give us. 
of all the things Leica and Panasonic's recently announced L squared initiative might take on. At the moment, this is what I'd most like to see. Because whether or not they do it, at some point, sooner rather than later, some other camera manufacturer will. Finally, fourth, in the end, as always, yes, it's about the gear, but no, it's not about the gear. It's about the people. Those of you who have followed the channel for years are already quite familiar with this refrain of mine. It's about what and how we see, how we feel. So what I'm about to share with you is now very personal. Claudia insisted that I do. The last time we were at the shore was without the kids. That was only three years ago. We spent a couple of days with my sister, Karen, and her husband, Andrew, once again at the end of the summer. Wonderful time of year to be at the shore, and we, of course, had a wonderful time. But on that trip, Claudia brought only her iPhone, her ambition, call it externally focused. She took really interesting, nice shots of the seascape and of people we didn't know. None of the people we did know and love. Which she deeply regrets to this day because six months later, Andrew was gone forever, one of the earliest victims of COVID. He'd been a fixture in our vacations at the shore going back 30 years. Because of this, and the fact that my sister and her children would be with us, we all knew this vacation would be bittersweet. So when Claudia chose her Z7 II, the part I left out earlier was this. More than anything else, she was not going to make the same mistake. She was going to capture at least one really good shot, a shot for the ages of each member of the family, which she did, but which I also will not share here. In this context, the weight or size of her camera didn't matter. Futzing didn't matter. The elements didn't matter. None of that mattered because what Claudia and I understood this time around was this. It is an exceptionally rare circumstance when any of us can truly know whether or not an opportunity presented to us in that moment will be our last opportunity. And this is what I most wanted to share with you today. Crab life. Don't let it distract you. Don't let work or headlines or anything else keep you from time with the people you love and who love you back. See them in the moment. Feel them in the moment, in the liminal spaces between. Capture those moments when you can so that you can burn them into your brain for your eternity. However long that eternity may actually turn out to be. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash you for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code HUE at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace.